If you're new to River of Grace, we want to be a church that's devoted to prayer and to the Word. We believe that the Word of God is our light, kind of turns on the light in our minds, in our darkened lives. And so uh, we usually go through books of the Bible consecutively. And right now we are in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. We're starting in verse 35, and we'll finish out the rest of chapter 12 today. Uh, Before I read it, I'll give you a second to turn there. We're going to consider how we can live faithfully in light of Christ's coming, how we can get ready for his return. All right, hear God's word from Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 35. These are the words of Jesus. Be ready for service and have your lamps lit. You are to be like people waiting for their master to return from the wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can open the door for him at once. Blessed will be those servants the master finds alert when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will get ready, have them recline at table, then come and serve them. If he comes in the middle of the night or even near dawn and finds them alert, blessed are those servants. But know this, if the homeowner had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. You also be ready, because the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Lord, Peter asked, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? The Lord said, who then is the faithful and sensible manager? His master will put in charge of his household servants to give them their allotted food at the proper time. Blessed is that servant whom the master finds doing his job when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming, and starts to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk, that servant's master will come on a day he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unfaithful. And that servant who knew his master's will and didn't prepare himself or do it will be severely beaten. But the one who did not know and did what deserved punishment will receive a light beating. From everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And from the, more, uh, from the one who has been entrusted with much, even more will be expected. I came to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already ablaze, but I have a baptism to undergo, and how it consumes me until it is finished. Do you think that I came here to bring peace on the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided. Three against two, and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, When you see a cloud rising in the west, right away you say, A storm is coming, and so it does. And when you see the south wind is blowing, you say, It's going to be hot, and it is. Hypocrites! You know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky, but why don't you know how to interpret this present time? Why don't you judge for yourselves what is right, as you are going with your adversary to the ruler and make an effort to settle with him on the way? Then he won't drag you before the judge. The judge hand you over to the bailiff, and the bailiff throw you into prison. I tell you, you will never get out of there until you have paid the last penny. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray for God's help. Father, I pray that you would send out your Holy Spirit to give us receptive hearts to the words of Jesus. There is a lot of hard content in here. Uh, Help us to receive it in your wisdom, and there's a lot of hopeful content, Lord, especially for those who are despairing or hopeless. Uh, Would you awaken hope in them? And for all of us, Lord, whether we're following you, we've been following you for decades, or are considering following you, would we prepare for your return? Amen. In the Odyssey, there's a king named Odysseus. This was probably required reading for some of you, maybe five, ten more years ago. Uh, So let me remind you a little bit about the Odyssey. There's this guy, he's a king. His name is Odysseus, and he went out to fight in the Trojan War, and he fought for 10 years there, and then he starts the return journey, and that's what the Odyssey is, and that takes another 10 years. 
So he leaves his, his kingdom in Ithaca. It's an island in Greece. And he's gone for 20 years. They don't have texting or cell service. And so everyone back at Ithaca doesn't know if he's dead or alive or if he's coming back or not. And so what happens is more than 100 men come as suitors trying to woo Odysseus' wife, who's a faithful wife, Penelope. These 100 suitors go into Odysseus' home. They beat Odysseus' servants. They woo his wife, and they mock his young son. These suitors act like Odysseus will never come back. Yet there are a few people in this story, more than a few, who are still holding out hope that King Odysseus will return. Among them are his wife, Penelope, his son, Telemachus, and one of his best friends and a swineherd, basically someone who raises pigs for a living. His name is Eumaeus. And Eumaeus is my favorite character in all of the Odyssey. He has a really humble job. He's fiercely loyal, and he has deep virtue and faithfulness towards his king. Emmaus, even though he had this humble job of herding pigs, woke up every single day like King Odysseus still ruled Ithaca. He lived every single day like King Odysseus would come back. And so he looked out for Telemachus, the king's son. He looked after his master's pigs for 20 years. And he did all of this without assurance that his king would actually come back one day. There's something beautiful and heartbreaking in that. For 20 years, he wakes up, looks to the coast, doesn't see his king, goes to work. AV team, just let me know if I need to move a certain direction. Um, so, our king and friend, Jesus, has promised us that he will return. And like Eumaeus, we are called, as we wait to him, to be faithful servants of our king. If we could pull up Revelation 22, verses 20 through 21. These are the last two verses in your Bible, and in them we get a pr uh, promise from our King Jesus. He who testifies about these things says, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with everyone. Amen. So we're not like Eumaeus in a sense that he didn't have any guarantee that his king would come back. We, as the people of God, have a sure promise, the last words of Jesus written in Scripture, yes, I am coming soon. And so, like Eumaeus, no matter how humble our present work is, in or out of the home, we're to carry it out as faithful servants of our King Jesus. And in our passage, King Jesus, he tells us to be ready, be faithful, and be decisive. Be ready, be faithful, and be decisive. And this is kind of the heart of the passage. Be ready for Christ's return by being faithful in the work he has given you. Be ready for Christ's return by being faithful in the work he has given you. So let's look at verses 35 through 40. Jesus is charging us, be ready. So Jesus has been teaching his disciples and huge crowds of thousands of people. He's talking about money, about not fearing people, but fearing God. He's talking about anxiety and giving to the poor. And he adds weight to his teaching at the end of this section by saying, you should live like this by fearing God, not fearing people, being generous to the poor and not being greedy. You should live like this because Jesus is coming back, or I am coming back. And for the first crowd who is listening to this, uh, this was kind of weird. They're like, Jesus, you're right here. You didn't go anywhere. Uh, what do you mean you're coming back? But now, more than 2,000 years later, looking back, we have a kind of a fuller understanding that Jesus came once to bring us into relationship with the holy God, and he's coming back again to make all things right. And so we see here he's teaching us how to live to get ready for his appearing. And he gives us four illustrations. Jesus was a master illustrator. He just took all these images from the world that he lived in to explain heavenly truths. And most of the images he takes for today's teaching are from the household, which was family, but also household servants. So that's most of the images he's coming from. If you look at verse 35, he says, be ready for service and have your lamps lit. So he gives us two images of readiness already. Now, be ready for service is a very understandable way of translating, let your loins be girded. 
Thankfully, they didn't put that right in there. But the image that Jesus is talking about here is many men in Jesus' day wore tunics that went down to their shins. And so if they were going to do hard labor or go to war, they would have to bring up their tunic and tie it in such a way that they could run, kind of make it into some shorts. So he's saying, he's using that image and he's saying, be ready like that. Tie up your tunic. Then he says, leave the light on. And then he goes on to explain, leave the light on like your servants at a master's house. And he went out to a wedding banquet. Now, I don't know if this is the case today, but at least in Jesus' day, Jewish wedding banquets could be like a couple days to a week. They know how to throw down. And so they're saying, you have, Jesus is saying, you have no idea when the master is going to come back, but you still are supposed to be ready. Now, I was trying to think of a modern image of a faithful, ready servant, and I thought immediately of the butler, Mr. Carson from Downton Abbey. He's a proper Brit. He has a a sense of what's proper and hierarchy and authority. And if you've watched Downton Abbey, Mr. Carson is an exemplary butler. He gives out to servants below him what's due them, whether it's food or rest. Uh, He also keeps them in check, focused on serving the family that they're a part of. So Jesus, in a sense, is saying, be ready for when your master comes back, just like Carson, wait, Mr. Carson waited on Mr. Crowley when he went to one of his galas or, you know, tea things. I don't know what Mr. Crowley was doing, but he's saying, be ready, have the lights on, leave the light on for when he returns. Jesus goes on to use a, a final image here of readiness, and he says in verse 39, know this, if the homeowner had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let, him, let his house be broken into. So he uses a negative image of being broken into at night, and he's saying, well, if the homeowner actually knew and was alert and had his security system up, maybe the shotgun facing towards the door, there would not be a robbery that night. So he takes all of these images of a world that's really removed from us, uh, and he says, be ready. So what does this really mean? The Apostle Peter, who is listening to this teaching, we'll hear him pipe up as he usually does in verse 41. Uh, in his first letter to churches in 1 Peter, it seems like he's reflecting on what his master Jesus taught him, and he explains for us, okay, what do all these images of readiness mean to gird the loins, leave the light on, be ready to receive your master, protect your home from a robber? He says this in 1 Peter 1.13, Therefore, with your minds ready for action, Be sober-minded and set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So he says, being ready for Jesus' return means setting your hope fully, putting all the weight of your hope, not on Christmas break, kids, not on that big vacation or that sabbatical from work, but on the return of Jesus Christ. That's what it looks like to be ready for his return. Peter goes on in the same letter and he says, Friends, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and sober-minded. There's that word again, sober-minded for prayer. So he's saying there's a spiritual drunkenness that we could all partake in if we're just consumed with news or social media or whatever's going on in Hollywood, we could just be dizzied by what's going on in the world. He's saying, no, take a bucket of cold water over your head, sober up, be spiritually sober. Jesus is coming back. Let's think about that often. And so that's what it means to be ready. And in verse 37, if you look there, Jesus gives the most amazing reward for those who are ready. Look at verse 37 with me. Jesus says, Blessed will be those servants the master finds alert when he comes. Why? Why are they blessed? Truly I tell you, he, that's the master, the master will get ready, have them recline at table, then come and serve them. There's no king like Jesus. Jesus is the king who serves. And when he finds his servants who are ready and waiting for him, he himself will say, now it's your turn to enter the party. Now it's your turn to recline at the table. I'll take up the towel and I'm going to serve you. He's not like so many kings or rulers in this day and age who are power hungry, needy, skeptical of other people. In his authority, Jesus is secure 
He's a good and gracious king, like we sang. He feeds us at his table when we gather, when we come to the Lord's table, and he will feed us in his banquet hall in heaven when he returns. You know, if you've ever tried to stay up, maybe you were a security guard at one point at your li- in your life, or maybe now, um, maybe you were waiting for someone to come home who forgot a key, and so you're trying to be ready for them. It could be exhausting to be in a constant state of alertness. Maybe you have some people in military and during boot camp, you had, you had to stay awake. It could be totally exhausting to stay in a constant state of alertness. But the Christian life now is a state of alertness, but it won't be forever. When Jesus returns, we can lay down our guard because we're in our shepherd's presence and we'll enjoy him forever. So let's be alert now and expecting rest when Jesus comes. So Jesus says, be ready, sober up, I'm coming back. Remind yourselves, church, as we gather week in and week out on Sundays and on weekdays at our community groups, remind yourself that Jesus is coming back. Now he says, as you wait, church, be faithful. So let's look at verse 41 and through 48. You got to love Peter. He's like the self-selected spokesperson for the disciples. So verse 41, Lord, Peter asks, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? It seems like, you know, Peter always wants to be on an in crowd and he's saying, is this a special word for, you know, me and the boys, the 11 of me, or is this kind of for everyone? And Jesus kind of like, Jesus actually, Jesus jukes him and says, yes. So he doesn't answer Peter's question directly. And actually he'll come around and say, Peter, you want authority, you want to lead, but that's a heavy weight to carry. But, Jesus is saying, I want everyone, whether you're a leader in the church or not, to listen and be ready and be faithful for my appearing. So he gives us three servants. Jesus gives us three servants here. In verse 42, he gives us the faithful manager. In verse 45, he talks about the unfaithful servant. And in verse 48, he talks about the ignorant servant. And then he talks about judgments and rewards for faithfulness or unfaithfulness. So let's look at each one of these servants in turn. Verse 42 through 44. The Lord said, Who then is the faithful and sensible manager his master will put in charge of his household servants to give them their allotted food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom the master finds doing his job when he comes. Again, think Mr. Carson, the butler. Jesus talks about a servant who's a manager, a sensible manager, who has some sense of authority and care for other people under him or her. Now, some of us, not all of us, but I would say most of us have been entrusted with care and maybe some sense of authority with other people. Parents, you are entrusted with the care of your children. Adult children, you are entrusted with the care of aging and dying parents. And it's just wonderful to see some of you in this church caring for your parents and leading them to the Lord's presence. Teachers, you are entrusted with authority over students, pastors over the church, bosses with their employees, shift leaders with their shift team, and so on. And Jesus is saying, the faithful servant is the one who takes care of those under their charge with justice, love, and wisdom. But there's a few there are, is another group of servants, unfaithful servants. And in our broken world, these are those who have been given authority but abuse it and act like there's no higher authority than them. They live like Jesus won't return. They might call it a myth or a fable. You might say Jesus doesn't really exist. He's a figment of your imagination. And instead of feeding others entrusted to their care, they feed themselves. Instead of giving to those who are poor under their care, they build bigger barns like we saw earlier in Jesus' teaching. And these are the unfaithful servants. And then finally in verse 48, there's a group of servants that are kind of ignorant. 48 says, But the one who did not know and deserved punishment and did what deserved punishment, will receive a light beating. And we'll get to the judgments and rewards in a second. But this third 
group of characters are servants, but they might not know the master or the master's will. And maybe you fall in this category this morning. You have a dawning sense on you that, okay, there is a God. I could see it in creation. I could see it in the trees. Uh, Maybe I could see it in relationships or just working in my life. There is a God, and now what? What does this God want from me? Who is this God? And Jesus says, that is a group, a category of servants. And so for each one of these categories of servants, there's a following judgment or reward depending on how they carried out their master's will. Those who are faithful managers and servants, Jesus will bless them and put them in charge of even more. It says, the unfaithful servant, and this is some of the harshest words that we hear from Jesus, will be cut literally in two and will be assigned with the place of the unfaithful. They will be severely beaten. And the one who is ignorant, who should have known better, but still didn't really know the master's will, that person will receive a light beating. And then Jesus finishes this section by saying in verse 48, from everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, even more will be expected. So this is kind of alarming, especially what we've heard from Jesus in the past. Like Jesus came to bring peace. Jesus came to bring joy. This passage of grown man Jesus sounds way different than the angel chorus is saying, peace on earth at his birth. Okay, this doesn't sound like a Christmas hymn. Now, what Jesus is saying in this parable is that he loves justice, and so he hates injustice. Jesus loves his little flock, and so he hates anything or anyone that harms them. So, yes, Jesus does bring peace. He does bring love. But sometimes that means defending, holding people account. Now, if you read through uh, the Odyssey, if you just read the last few chapters and uh, King Odysseus and his son Telemachus and the swineherd Eumaeus are like throwing down on these hundred captors, (laughs) I mean, it gets really brutal. They, They slaughter every single one of these hundred suitors who are trying to go after Penelope. You would be like, not my cup of tea. So much for a classic. I'm going to read whatever was, you know, on the New York Times bestseller list. But if you've been following along the whole entire story and then you get onto that part, yeah, it's still a little gruesome, but you are fired up like during the Brady era. You know, you're standing up like, let's go, Odysseus, take him down, right? And I truly think, even though this is a hard judgment passage from Jesus, that if we see Jesus for what he's really doing when he returns, when he's judging the world, we won't see him as a monster, but we'll see him as the Messiah, making all things right in goodness, in truth, and in beauty. So the question for us, the big question from this text is, how can we be a faithful servant? How can we be a faithful servant? And Jesus gives us the answer in verse 43. He says, Blessed is that servant whom the master finds doing his job when he comes. So how do we be a faithful servant? Be faithful in the work that Jesus has given you. And I really mean you, particularly. Your assignment is different than the person sitting next to you. Each one of you has your particular work, whether paid or unpaid, particular relationships, particular place that you live in, and Jesus, in his wisdom, has given you a specific assignment in your lifetime, and he says, be faithful in that until I come back. Now, before we get into kind of the particulars of what that may look like, um, I want to address maybe some questions that are popping up in your mind. One of them might be, Well, that was a letdown. Be faithful in the work he has given me. Well, I don't really like my work right now. I don't like my roommate. I don't like my spouse. I don't like my boss. I don't like the work Jesus has given me right now. Well, what do we say to that? Um, I enjoy cooking, and so do my kids, so they'll hop in and help me sometimes cooking. It's just a glorious mess. 
Uh, it took me a while to accept that. But uh, last night, two of my kids wanted to help cook, and I said, okay. And they saw some stuff laid out, you know, like an onion, the Instant Pot, stuff like that. It's like, okay, get the broom. And immediately, both of them sunk. I don't want to get the broom. Mama says, Mama's making something else. Get the brown sugar. I don't want to get the brown sugar. Maybe we feel like that with Jesus. You say, all right, Jesus, I'm signing up for your mission. And then you're saying, all right, serve in nursery. Oh, oh man, Jesus, I don't want to do that. Love your neighbor. Bring them a meal. Oh, man, do you know my neighbor, Jesus? But the, the beauty of it is if you're in that place where you really don't like the assignment you have from Jesus, like with my kids, if they were faithful and little, they got a little more. So one of my kids actually did come around to cutting the onion after they took the broom to me. The other kid actually did get to crack the egg after they brought the brown sugar, work that they really enjoyed. And that's what Jesus is saying. Be faithful in that little because it's really about trust. What Jesus is doing when he gives you that little assignment is saying, do you trust my wisdom? Do you know that I'm over this whole church? Now, what if you feel like your work is too small or insignificant? I mean, we as Americans, we idolize the big, the fast, the famous. And if our lives don't get enough likes, then we feel like absolute losers. Well, a while ago in Scotland, there's this Presbyterian minister named John Brown. And I don't think I put this up, sorry. Uh, But John Brown, he was a wise, older pastor for decades, and this one young pastor wrote to him complaining about how small his church was. And I love this sage wisdom from John Brown. He says to this young man, I know the vanity of your heart and that you will feel mortified that your congregation is very small in comparison with those of your brethren around you. But assure yourself of the word of an old man, that when you come to give an account of them, that's your church, to the Lord Christ at his judgment seat, you will think you have had enough. So what he's saying there is, you're bemoaning the fact that you have such a small church, but when you stand in front of Jesus and have to give account for every single man, woman, and child in your church, you will think you've had a big enough congregation. So just think about that. If you think your work is too small or insignificant, those who teach or lead or are in a place of authority will have it much harder on the day of judgment. So what does, what does this look like, being faithful in our posts, giving ourselves to the assignment Jesus has given us? First, it looks like asking God what your assignment is. Maybe you're in a transition right now. This often happens around college age or post-college or after retirement. You're wondering, okay, Jesus, what do you actually want me to do? James 1 tells us, ask God and he'll give you wisdom. You could also ask a trusted friend. They'll have insight into your gifts, who God has made you to be, opportunities you might already have that you're just overlooking. So first, ask God what your assignment is. Then plant roots where you are until God replants you. This is especially hard. If you just kind of like me, you're looking, the grass is green over there. You see a friend doing this, and you're thinking about all these opportunities, but you're not where God is. Has placed you. So plant roots until God replants you. Like Jim Elliott, the missionary, said, wherever you are, be all there on assignment. And third, look for opportunities to do good. Look for opportunities to do good in your assignment, at your workplace, at your home, to your family, to your neighbor. And finally, this, this really helps me. Whether you're clocking in or your feet touch the ground at the beginning of the day, ask yourself, How would I live today if Jesus came back tonight? How would I live today if Jesus came back tonight? So Jesus has called us to be ready, then to be faithful, and finally, in these last sections, he says, be decisive. You have a decision to make. Will you be a faithful servant in light of my coming, or will you live like I'm not coming back at all? And in verses 49 through 59, Jesus presses us to be decisive. Let's look at verse 49. I came to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already set ablaze. But I have a baptism to undergo, and how it consumes me until it is finished. So Jesus, 
He's the master teacher. He kind of takes me, takes us to a different place now. And he starts talking about fire and water. And maybe his voice is getting louder and he's getting zealous. And he's saying, I'm consumed. I want the earth to be set ablaze, but I have a baptism to undergo. And we're like, what are you talking about, Jesus? So fire, an element in this world, can have multiple meanings in Scripture. And here, Jesus is talking about, I want to come back. I want to make all things right. I want to destroy evil and rebuild this beautiful world that God has made. But first, I have a baptism to undergo. Now, that's a little tricky because if you've been following us through Luke or you know the gospel of Luke yourself, Jesus has already been baptized. And as the God-man, I'm assuming that he hasn't forgotten that fact. But Jesus is talking about a different baptism. And if you look at the Old Testament, sometimes baptism is spoken of as judgment. One of the clearest places you could see that is in the Exodus. Pharaoh's army, as they were following Israel, was baptized by the water. They were slam dunked on by the water in judgment. And the psalmist speaks like this. King David speaks like this. We could pull up the couple verses where he talks about uh, baptism as judgment. This is the psalmist speaking to God at a time of deep darkness. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your billows have swept over me. So it's this sense of, God, you're really not pulling punches right now. It feels like my life feels like one wave after another, and I feel crushed. It's a baptism of judgment. Later, Jesus' disciples in the Gospel of Mark, they're trying to elevate themselves and see who the most important uh, disciple is. And this is what Jesus says to them. You don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup I drink or to be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? So here, baptism means Jesus' own judgment that he receives on the cross. He's saying, I wish the world was set ablaze and everything was made right, but before then, I have a baptism to undergo in that job Going to the cross is consuming me. I am focused on that job before all things are made right. What Jesus is saying is, through the cross, he is giving us a way out of final judgment. That horrible judgment that we heard for the unfaithful and ignorant servants who we all are. How many of us would say we've loved God or our neighbor or even been a stellar employee our whole entire lives? None of us would. But Jesus is saying the judgment that you deserve for being an unfaithful and ignorant servant who doesn't want to know your master's will will be placed on me on the cross. And so before the big final judgment, Jesus took a decisive judgment on the cross, not for his sins, he was sinless, but for ours, unfaithful servant, the faithful servant for the unfaithful. And so if you haven't looked to Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, release from all the debts you owe to God and to other people. Look to him. He will forgive you, and you won't look upon his return or judgment day as a terrible thing, but as one of the most beautiful days that you're looking forward to. So Jesus presses us to make a decision, and he says, my coming is going to bring division among even the closest relationships. If you look at verse 52 and 53, he's, talking, he's quoting Micah, a prophet, and he's saying, my coming is going to divide father and son and daughter and mother and daughter-in-law. And it's not because Jesus loves division in and of itself, but it, he offers peace to all, and those who receive him enter that family of peace, but those who reject him also reject his people. As one commentator put it beautifully and concisely, reconciliation to God can mean separation from people. Reconciliation to God can mean separation from people, not in all cases. So Jesus says, who are you going to decide? Who's your biggest allegiance going to be towards? Your family, co-workers, friends you grew up with, or are you going to follow me in light of my return? Then he says in verse 54, know the times. And he rebukes them. He's saying, you guys are pretty good weathermen. You see the scorching heat coming up from the Sahara, and you say, man, it's going to be a hot day, and it is. 
You see the clouds forming, and you say a storm is coming, and you're right. But you see me, and I'm the Messiah. I'm standing in front of you, and you don't understand the times. He's saying, you don't know that I'm coming to bring division between those who will trust in me and those who won't. You don't know that I'm coming again to restore all things. Now, Jesus tells us to know the times. Um, Some take this command to mean, okay, let's pin a date down when Jesus is coming back. Let's get the calendar out. Let's get the news reel going. And let's start, let's look, start looking at some Old Testament prophecies. Okay, I don't think that's what Jesus has in mind. Now, especially in light of this week and what's going on in the Middle East, Jesus has given us some general signs, wars, rumors of wars, all these things that are going to um, kind of announce his arrival. But he doesn't say exactly when that's going to be. He says no one knows when he's coming back. And every once in a while, I have someone ask me, like, hey, did you see this war started? Did you see this famine started? Do you think Jesus is coming back? And I would say, yes, because he said he is. But my concern, especially if that's you today, or if you have friends like this who are so captivated by the newsreel and looking at planning on when he's coming back, is that that leads to fear and not to faithfulness. That leads to speculation and not to service. And if it is the case, glorious day, Jesus is coming back tomorrow, Monday evening at 6 p.m., he doesn't want us to be in speculation or fear, but he wants us to be rejoicing that our king is coming. We're going to see his face. So let's serve him in tomorrow's shift. Let's serve him with our families and roommates tonight. Let's love our neighbors with all of our heart, soul, and strength until he comes back. And if he doesn't happen to come Monday evening, Let's continue to do that because we know that Jesus is coming back. So he says, know the times. Now, if we look at Acts chapter 1, after Jesus has died, resurrected, now he's about to ascend to the Father where he is right now with his body. His disciples ask him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? Jesus said to them, it's not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Sumeria and to the ends of the earth. So Jesus says, it's not for you to know the exact details, the minutia of the timeline of when I'm coming back. Just know the big times that have come to save and I'm coming again to judge. And now what Jesus is saying is, you have the Holy Spirit, tag, you're on mission. Go make disciples of all nations. So we're called not to fear, but to faithfulness on mission and in service. And Jesus tells this final parable in verse 57, and he's kind of asking us to imagine this. Why don't you judge for yourselves what is right? As you are going with your adversary to the ruler, make an effort to settle with him on the way. Then he won't drag you before the judge, and the judge hand you over to the bailiff, and the bailiff throw you into prison. I tell you, you will never get out of there until you have paid the last penny. So he's saying, imagine you owe tons of money to someone you know. Maybe it's a school counselor or someone you bought something from, and they're taking you to court. He's saying, on the way to court, see if you could settle up with them any way that you can, because once you go to court... You're going to be condemned under the plaintiff, and you won't get out until you pay the last penny. And by the way, you're in debt. You don't have any pennies. So he's saying this is an eternal uh, imprisonment, so settle up before you make it to the judge. What Jesus is saying to us is settle up with me, the one who could forgive you, restore you, and advocate for you on that last day before you stand before the judge. He's saying that day is coming. Settle up now. And he's also saying with your neighbors, if you've wronged your neighbors, if you've wronged someone in your family or a coworker, settle up with them. Love your neighbor well in light of Jesus' coming. And so Jesus has pressed us this morning to be ready, to be faithful, and to be decisive. We live in a country that idolizes fame. But Jesus values faithfulness. 
Faithfulness, if we think about it, faithfulness is true beauty. If you go to a diner after church and you see an older couple holding hands across the dining table and and they have wrinkled hands and they're just smiling at each other with wrinkles in their eyes, that's beautiful. Some of you might choke up. I wouldn't. I would. If you see someone caring for an aging parent, the parent who first cared for them, that's beautiful. When you see a friend stick by someone through sickness or through a really dark time, that's beautiful. And I wonder if you think of the person that comes to mind who has shown faithful love to you. Just think about that throughout the day or even now. Who is the person that comes to mind who has shown faithful love to you? That person is beautiful. They are the true heroes of the story. Their faithfulness is beautiful in God's sight. And so we're all faced with this decision this morning. Will we live for ourselves and for our own little kingdom, or will we be servants in God's? Will we faithfully love Jesus and others in light of his return, or will we live life for self and be the unfaithful servant? My prayer for us is that we all make the right decision to be faithful until the king returns. So as we turn towards the Lord's table, King Jesus is unique as a ruler. He serves his people in the most intimate way. Um, As our community groups are going through caring for one another, Ed Welch, the counselor, talks about what other king pursues us like Jesus. You know, try to get a lunch meeting with the governor or the president. Uh, Tough luck. But Jesus plans a, a table gathering with us week in and week out in the most intimate way. He feeds us with his bread, which represents his body, and nourishes us with the cup, which represents the spilt blood for us. So for any of you who are trusting in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins and for new life today, even if you're not a member at this church, you're welcome to the Lord's uh, table. We'll have servants up front with a basket of bread. You can take a piece of that, and then we dip it in the cup, and then eat that on your way to your seat or at your seat. If you're not believing in Jesus yet, in light of his coming, settle your debts with him. He plans to erase all the debts of any who come to him. And then after you do that, as part of God's family, you are welcome to the table. So on the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this, church, in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And he will come again soon. Let's pray.